Welcome to this new episode of The Context. Today we will be talking about technology adoption and what are the principles that can drive a proper behavior both from individuals as well as corporations and society at large when facing jolting technologies. I have participated just for the past uh, two days uh, at uh, the Singularity U Italy Summit. And uh, as it is customary, uh, because this was the third edition and the same thing happened in the previous two years, there were protests welcoming the participants and the speakers and the organizers, protests against technology, protests against science, protests against the type of progress that Singularity University represents. So I was able to to ask myself, where does this anguish come from? Where does this anger come from? Luckily, the protests were loud, but totally peaceful, and uh, there was no apparent uh, danger or threat to our physical security. Certainly, as it is appropriate, our mental models were challenged. And maybe this episode is a a counter-proposal to the challenges of a mental model that sees only the risks, that sees only the downsides of innovation and of technology. The first year when the people protesting uh, appeared, actually they were already there when I arrived uh, uh, and and they recognized me and they said, oh, uh, Orban is here and uh, I realized what was going on. I parked the car and walked up to them to greet them and to have a dialogue. And I was a little bit let down that uh, they said that they were not interested in having a conversation. The year after, and uh, this year too, I went back and shook their hands and, 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 and welcomed them, as well as I also went to the police, which were there. And, you know, they, they knew about the protest. <laughs> Maybe they needed some permits, so they were already alerted, and they came out, and I, and I greeted the police as well, and I asked how they were doing, if they wanted a coffee or something. Uh, but anyway, neither last year nor this year I attempted having a conversation anymore, after what they replied uh, the the first year. And I'm sure that there can be situations where conversations are not particularly useful. They will not change anybody's mind. The positions are too far apart. But what is pretty amazing to me is that the flyers, the leaflets that the protesters were distributing sound very much what I am saying in these videos or what I write on the blog posts. And it is really strange to read those words knowing that they are cited in a completely negative manner, when they are the same sentences that, to my mind, are very positive. One of the things that I didn't do and I couldn't do is to go to them and ask, oh, I'm so sorry, would you like some some?" not only coffee, but maybe a hot soup or, or a coat or shoes. Because evidently, if you negate the value of technology, you go about your life without 
uh, being able to leverage the tools that civilization provides us with without being able to leverage medicines and uh, electricity and uh, cars and trains and airplanes. Well, probably that is not the case, which actually means that even people who are pretty fanatical and fundamentalist in their views to the point where they don't believe there is any value in a conversation, in a dialogue with those that don't think like them, even those cannot do without technology, which is quite mind-blowing if you think about it. Technology has so much value that even those who hate it must use it. Evidently, the benefits of technology and the benefits of innovation are much greater than not the downsides and the costs and the risks. Analyzing these benefits, of course, is easy when the facets of any given technology are well known. And analyzing when and how that technology should be ad adopted uh, is almost trivial. From the point of view of a corporation, that is too late. That is too far in the technology adoption cycle to represent any sustainable competitive advantage. The very reason why the implications are well understood is because a lot of other companies has, uh, have adopted the technology that is being analyzed. And since a lot of other companies have adopted it, you will be at least middling, but maybe even a late adopter, and you will not be able to gain any competitive benefit. The only thing that you will do is not fall further behind. This means that if you want to adopt technology in order to improve your competitive positioning, you must do so by definition at a point in time when not everything is understood around it, when the costs of the disruption that the particular technology will create haven't been fully measured, where the risks are not completely modeled, where you cannot be sure that the exact path that you are following is going to be the winning one. So you will have to take reasonable precautions. You will have to, for example, operate in uh, an experimentation at small scale and isolation so that the potential fallout of an experiment that goes wrong cannot contaminate the entire organization. But also because, by definition, an organization that can afford to do these experiments will be a successful full one, a confident one. An organization that is, since it is successful and confident in its own ways, will see, somewhat myopically but unavoidably, these experiments as wasteful. And the organization, the immune system, will try to stop the experiments if they are not protected against this immune reaction. Now, taking reasonable precautions is the key word here. Because precautions and being 
risk averse can be definitely going too far. As a matter of fact, the precautionary principle that assumes that complex systems must not be perturbed because the consequences of our change are inherently pre unpredictable and we will cause chaos and we will end up with a negative balance between the benefits and the costs of uh, what we, we are doing, this precautionary principle, in my opinion, goes to this excess that we should avoid. It is somewhat tragic that the precautionary principle is part of those principles that the European Union adopts as one of its founding principles. And as a consequence, the European Union is very much risk averse, very much averse towards innovation. Developing, experimenting, deploying and adopting new technologies in Europe is difficult due to this original sin of the precautionary principle. The proactionary principle, formulated originally by Max Moore, is an alternative that aims to take into consideration the opportunity cost of not developing the innovative solutions that we may need in order to address the challenges we are facing, that is advocating proportional measures, not absolute bans, that advocates these experiments to preserve uh, the freedom of individuals and organizations to trace their own path towards the solution that they are seeking. And to me, it looks like that the proactionary principle is much more well adapted to the needs of our times than its predecessor, the precautionary principle. So as you go about looking at new technologies, you must keep these principles in mind and, of course, strike your own balance to understand how your organization is able to uh, face the unavoidably complex consequences of the experiments that you will be executing. Now, traditionally, the areas of knowledge are divided between things that we know, things that we know we don't know, and the most frightening unknown unknowns. That is why these days when we are seeing an acceleration of technological change, open systems are much better to prepare organizations to understand the dynamic that they are exposing themselves to. Unknown unknowns will have a variable landscape and being able to compare notes and to share information about experiments and to leverage the knowledge and the practices of other organizations which open innovation and open collaboration promotes is going to be better than not failing in isolation. Cory Doctorow, the science fiction author, uses to uh, cite the example of alchemists who would die in secret with the outcome of their mortally dangerous experiments as they were trying to transform lead in gold using various chemicals 
often poisonous. But since they would be doing these in a very closed, closeted, mystical and mysterious secret environment, nobody could learn from their mistakes. Unknown unknowns, of course, can be dangerous. And being able to share the burden and share the risk and uh, have uh, peers uh, in the adventure back to back trying to make sure that unknown unknowns don't kill us is the right way to go about all of this. Also because, as we know, with jolting technologies, we cannot afford to wait. It used to be that we would say, oh, exponentially accelerating technologies are progressing much much faster than merely linear phenomena. We are accustomed to linearly changing systems, but now we must change our mindset to be able to recognize and adopt exponential technologies. But now, whether it is in uh, digital biology or it is uh, in quantum computing or many other fields, we are seeing an increasing rate of acceleration. We are seeing jolting technologies, which means that we have even less time to wait on the sidelines until the features, the characteristics, and the consequences of technologies are worked out. We have to be even more prepared to make mistakes and to make sure that we don't die from those mistakes, that we can learn from those mistakes as we are adopting these jolting technologies. Unavoidably, when we are successful in these experiments done at small scale and isolation, per definition, if jolting technologies are included in these experiments, they will explode in the view with a transformational power that will encompass the organization that created the experiment, regardless of how isolated and how protected it is. And if it is successful, per definition, this experiment will become the core of something new that the organization will morph into. These days, um, Nokia is not an example of corporate success anymore. But what many remember uh, even less is that Nokia uh, was originally a Finnish maker of uh, completely different goods from the phones that we have learned to love them for the time that they were leaders uh, of these phones. Um, Originally, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Nokia was um, a a local Finnish uh, producer of uh, boots and and, and woodworks of, of various kinds, certainly not a high technology provider. And, and many other companies uh, have uh, uh, different routes uh, that um, uh, make them unrecognizable to those that learned about them in their original embodiment. So as you adopt new technologies and as you carry out experiments Since you want those experiments sooner or later to be successful, you have to be ready 
as an organization, but also as an individual, psychologically, to fully embrace the power of that new thing that you become. That you become first as an organization, and then, depending on the technologies that we are talking about, that you become as an individual as well. This is maybe one of the most interesting conundrums, in my opinion, that the protesters highlighted and where their manifesto is still aligned with the things that I'm saying, except that they label it very negatively and I label it very positively. I not only believe in the positive value of change, I believe in the necessity of change. The alternative to the change, basically for me, is death. Is death to the individual and death to the organization. Because by being constant to itself, faithful to itself, it makes itself unfit to exist and let alone thrive in a future that is coming rapidly. I hope that you liked this episode of The Context. I welcome your questions and feedback. I am receiving quite a few pieces of uh, email responding to the newsletter that I send uh, or comments on the videos. Um, I am very easily reachable on Twitter, Facebook, uh, my website uh, via email. You can just use your favorite search engine and you can find me and you can get in touch with me. I am open to conversations, including with those that have opposing views to mine. And I welcome your questions, and I hope that uh, you enjoy this and the future episodes of uh, The Context. If you do, you can support it on Patreon for $5 or less, so that I can produce the future episodes together with my team. I am receiving enhancement requests, and we are working towards including illustrations, charts, sources, a higher production value in future episodes of the context, as you requested. Thank you very much.